of the water. Uh, I want to welcome uh, Ms. Holmes Norton and Mr. Kucinich, uh, members of the subcommittee, uh, hearing witnesses, and all those in attendance. The purpose of today's hearing is to examine the authority's current financial condition and internal controls, proposed operational and service changes, safety and security initiatives, and to update the subcommittee on pending capital improvements at uh, WMATA and all related funding. The chair, the ranking member, and the subcommittee members will each have five minutes to make opening statements, and all members will have three days to submit statements for the record. Hearing no objection, it is so ordered. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, again, let me welcome you to the subcommittee's first District of Columbia related oversight hearing of the 111th Congress. As mentioned earlier, the purpose of today's hearing is to explore and examine a host of issues currently confronting the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority in its effort to efficiently operate its metro rail, metro bus, and metro access transit services. It's been a little over four years since we, on this committee, have had a uh, Washington Area Transit Authority focused hearing. And while much has improved for what is known as America's, America's transit system, a few systemic challenges continue to remain. And we will try to address those today. Although today's hearing won't bring a final resolution to many of the Transit Authority's core questions of pressing concern, the hearing is intended to continue, in some respects, renew the dialogue between WMATA and regional partners and the federal government. As the primary provider of mass transit throughout the nation's capital and surrounding area, WMATA's operations are intricately intertwined and linked to the continual functionality of the federal government. As many of you are aware, Metro Rail and Metro Bus are responsible for the transportation of nearly 70 percent of the area's federal workers uh, to and from work on a daily basis. The transit system plays a critical role in our emergency preparedness efforts, and it's often re heavily relied upon by the federal government for publicly supported events such as the recent inauguration of our new president or other national mall celebrations. In fact, the mere creation of WMATA by way of the 1967 Interstate Compact was in many ways based upon the rationale that the large presence of federal government activities and the attraction of the nation's capital as a premier tourist destination required the need for the development of a reliable public transit system for the na nation's capital and its region. Uh, fast forwarding to today, WMATA has blossomed into a robust and leading transit agency in charge of operating the second largest rail system in, and the fifth largest bus network in the country, covering about 1,500 square mile areas. Uh, WMATA now operates a fleet of some 1,500 buses serving over 330 routes and provides metro rail services to 86 stations on five rail lines and 106 miles of track, much of which has been constructed using federal dollars. While these facts and regions continue continually rely, I'm sorry, while these facts and the regions continued reliability on Metro Rail bus and its paratransit service points to the access of 30 plus years old transit system, WMATA continues to face serious financial, operational, and now post -September, September 11 security challenges. To that end, <clears throat> it is my hope that today's hearing will provide the subcommittee with the most current developments in WMATA's operations, finance, safety initiatives, and infrastructure improvement efforts. Whether it's a frank conversation on the remaining facets of WMATA's dedicated funding effort <clears throat> or on management's proposed metro bus service cuts and route adjustments, today's oversight proceedings are purely meant to provide us as a national capital area, uh, stakeholders, and the opportunity to discuss and explore common solutions to a common asset the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. I'd like to thank those who have agreed to testify today. And I understand uh, some of our witnesses obviously didn't take the Metro because they're not here yet. Uh, I look forward to a productive but not necessarily lengthy hearing uh, as the subcommittee has been made aware of your various afternoon commitments of, of our witnesses. And also, uh, I'm sure most are aware uh, there is a special joint uh, Republican Democratic Caucus 
regarding the uh, ongoing swine flu epidemic that uh, all members have been asked to attend. So uh, when that begins, obviously the, the attendance here will, will, uh, will decline. Uh, but necessarily we will, we will push on and, and try to address all of the issues that we'd like to uh, address in this hearing. Again, I thank you. And uh, normally I would yield to the ranking member, uh, Mr. Chaffetz from Utah, for his opening remarks. Uh, he is also uh, a member of three other committees uh, that are currently meeting as well, but he has been kind enough to allow us uh, to waive his, his statement uh, and, and to press forward with, with testimony. Uh, at this point, I think it might best serve us, because Mr. Graham is not here and he's on our first panel, if I might defer uh, to my colleagues uh, for their opening statements, it might be a good use of our time. Uh, I'd first like to recognize uh, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton, who was one of the driving forces to have this uh, hearing so early in our, in our uh, proceedings and who has been a, an outspoken advocate uh, for her constituents in, in their reliance on uh, the Metro Rail service and, and bus service. Uh, so I now recognize uh, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for your uh, early hearing on WMATA because it uh, signifies uh, the, re the recognition of, of the subcommittee uh, and the full committee of how dependent we are as a federal government on WMATA uh, and on hearing of its concerns at, in a time when uh, all facilities of every kind are stretched. I want to congratulate Mr. Cato to his face again because uh, uh, Mr. Cato, you and your employees performed magnificently during the inauguration. Uh, not only did you, you uh, provide services at unheard of hours, uh, but <laughs> when, when I asked you to even go beyond the call of duty when you had stretched as far as you could go, uh, you and your employees did so. The entire country, we saw two million people come here. Uh, could not have had this inauguration at all without you, and we are very proud of the of the work you have done, sir. Um, the bill that we strove so hard for, uh, the Passenger Rail and Improvement Act, I think we called it, for uh, 1.5 billion dollars over 10 years for Wamara, uh, it seems to me has been vindicated by your performance, uh, even without. A, a penny of that money flowing with huge strain on its facilities. At, some, at one point, Mr. Cato thought he simply couldn't go much further uh, in keeping hours uh, beyond the expected hours simply because of the strain on capital uh, facilities because none of that money has flowed. And even when it flows, it'll have to flow a long time before it makes up for for what has uh, been denied. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I am also a member of the Homeland Security Committee, and I must say that quite apart from the daily activities of the federal government, we now have an additional reason why we cannot do without WMATA. Uh, if nothing else is running, as we learned when the farmer shut down <laughs> downtown uh, a few years ago, WMATA simply has to uh, be running and we in, in Homeland Security have paid special attention to WMATA as well. Now that you have shown, um, Mr. Cato, what you can do, a lot of us are trying to get that first uh, installment in the $1.5 billion, uh, $150 million due year by year. Um, somebody tried to hold us up, I think, <laughs> saying that if you, don't do, if you don't do something, we won't do something. Hey, <laughs> we don't have to do anything. And what members had to do to get this bill uh, in the first place, and what we're going to have to do, even if the president puts it in his budget to keep it in there, I don't even think you want to know about. I just hope that we are able during these hard times to get that first $150 million. I'm very concerned, as I'm sure the entire region is, and while this is seen as a, um, a, a service here in the nation's capital, it stretches far and wide into the region. I am concerned about the layoffs and the, bu and, and the bus service uh, issues that have arisen, notwithstanding the Recovery Act um, 
funds, and I would be most concerned to see where, why those Recovery Act funds have not been more helpful in that regard. Again, I can't thank you enough, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the, the uh, way in which you have moved forward early so that we can make sure that not only do the trains keep running on time, but that the federal government keeps running because the trains are running on time. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, the Chair will now recognize the gentleman from Northern Virginia, uh, Mr. Connolly, who also, uh, his constituents as well, he's had a long uh, history of, of dealing with these issues on, on behalf of uh, uh, the families of Northern Virginia and is, uh, is uh, extremely uh, familiar with all the issues confronting WMATA going forward. So uh, I'll recognize the gentleman from Virginia for five minutes. Thank you. And I can't thank you enough, uh, Chairman Lynch, for holding these hearings on the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. Uh, though many may not be familiar with the acronym WMATA, it is absolutely essential for the operations of the Federal Government. On average, 120,000 Federal employees commute to work in Metro, representing 40 percent of peak ridership. 56,000 of those employees live in my district, many of whom commute into the Pentagon or Washington, D.C. on the orange, blue, and yellow lines of Metro Rail. This transit service is essential, Mr. Chairman, to the quality of life of suburban residents in our region. If not for WMATA's transit system, it would be necessary to construct an additional 1,400 lane miles of highway and 160,000 parking spaces to serve commuters who otherwise now use Metro. This transit service is also essential to protect regional air quality and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Without transit service provided by WMATA, it would be impossible to meet federal clean air standards in this region, which would result uh, in the region losing transportation funding. The decline in ground level ozone that we've achieved in the region has been enabled by the ability of area residents to avail themselves of rail or bus transit and by WMATA's investment in compressed natural gas, ultra low sulfur diesel and hybrid electric technologies to reduce smog creating pollutants from buses. With respect to climate change, Metro eliminates 1 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions annually by eliminating vehicle trips, the equivalent of saving 75,000 gallons of gasoline. When the region embarked on construction of the 106-mile metro system, the federal government, as you indicated, Mr. Chairman, paid 80 percent of the construction costs. For the extension of the Silver Line, however, to Dulles Airport, the premier airport for the national capital region, the federal government will only pay 16 percent of those project costs. The rest of it is borne by the state and local governments. It is scandalous that the federal government provides a pittance for transit service to the national capital region. Extension of transit service is essential not only for the continued operation of the federal government, including provision of transportation options for federally employed commuters, but also for this region's continued economic prosperity. For the past eight years, we have had to work with an administration that appeared to be ideologically opposed to funding extensions to transit systems. This ideologically driven obstructionism has been harmful to our region and others. With a new administration and a pending transportation authorization bill, I believe that we can jumpstart extensions of transit service here in the national capital region and around the country, with the federal government contributing its fair share. I greatly appreciate the work of my predecessor and my colleagues, including Ms. Norton, in passing Title VI of the Passenger Rail Investment and Improvement Act, which provided $150 million in dedicated funding for Metro, being matched by Virginia, Maryland, and the District of Columbia. Metro is the only major transit system in the United States without a dedicated source of funding. In addition to increasing funding for transit, we need to examine ways to eliminate bureaucratic obstacles to new starts. During the process of approving the Rail to Dulles project, we encountered numerous nonsensical requirements that proposed projects had to meet by the Federal Government. These requirements delayed project approval and construction, adding billions, literally, of cost to the pro final project cost. We also need to understand how we can move to extend Metro Rail service in our region. Since Metro Rail began operations in 1976, our region has grown far beyond the outer Metro Rail stations. Residents and communities in uh, the suburban uh, Virginia and Maryland uh, should have the option of rail transit. I have introduced legislation, Mr. Chairman, to authorize transit extensions in the orange, blue, yellow and purple line corridors, and I look forward to hearing Mr. Cato's response to that legislation. I hope this hearing provides the committee with insight on how to expedite these and other extensions. And again, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding a hearing on this very important topic to the national capital region, and I look forward to working with you and my colleagues as we move forward. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. 
Uh, as uh, my Republican colleagues arrive, we will obviously extend them the courtesy of, of making any opening statements that they, they wish to make. Uh, it is the custom in this committee to ask uh, witnesses to be sworn. Um, and I please ask you to rise and raise your right hand. Uh, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee today is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record show that each of the witnesses has answered in the affirmative. And uh, to begin, your, your written statements will be uh, accepted into the record without objection. Uh, the way the uh, hearing works is uh, that little box in front of you will, uh, will flash various colors. Uh, the green light indicates that you have five minutes to summarize your written statement and uh, verbalize those, uh, the contents to the committee. Uh, a yellow light means that you have one minute remaining and then a, a red light indicates that your allotted time has expired. Uh, for the benefit of the members who are here, let me just do a brief introduction of our, our first panel witnesses. Uh, Council Member Jim Graham became chairman of the Metro Board in January 1999. Mr. Graham currently serves on the Council of the District of Columbia, representing Ward 1. He, is also the chair, he also chairs the Council's Committee on Public Works and Transportation. Mr. Graham served as Executive Director of the Whitman Walker Clinic from 1984 to 1998. Previously, Mr. Graham served as staff counsel for Senator Abe Ribicoff, Democrat of Connecticut, and clerk to Chief Justice Earl Warren, now retired. Uh, Mr. John B. Cato is the general manager for Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. Uh, Mr. Cato has more than 30 years of experience in public transportation. As general manager of the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, he oversees the second largest rail transit system and the fifth largest bus, bus network in the United States, with more than 10,000 employees, a $1.3 billion operating budget, and a $3.1 billion five-year capital improvement program. With that, we welcome uh, each of our witnesses. And Mr. Graham, I welcome you to uh, offer your opening statement. Thank you very uh, much, Chairman Lynch. Excuse my voice. I'm laboring under the Washington, D.C allergies, <clears throat> but I'm going to do my, here I have some water here, maybe that would help me a little bit. I want to do my best here on behalf of the system. As you point out, I am the chairman of the Metro WMATA board. I have previously held this position in 2003, which was a very different time than today. But it is all the same, a time of great excitement for the Metropolitan Washington Area Transit Authority. I want to say a special hello to Congressman Connolly. This is the first time I've seen you since your ascendancy to this, to, to this great body. I congratulate you. And to my congressional representative, Eleanor Holmes Norton, it's always a great pleasure to see you. We saw each other yesterday at a very, very happy event. And I hope this one today is every bit as happy and satisfying. Um, let me just note that the metro, metro means more than anything else, mobility. Uh, metro rail and metro bus serve a population of over 3.5 million within a one point, uh, within 15,000 square mile area. An average weekday passenger trips on the two systems total nearly 1.3 billion, excuse me, 1.3 million. Metro access, which is our service to people living with disabilities, provides 4,900 passenger trips on an average weekday. No neighborhood or community within the District of Columbia is more than two blocks from Metro bus services. Metro also stimulates regional economic development. And Mr. Chairman, I don't need to read about that because I know in Ward 1, in Columbia Heights, in U Street, on Georgia Avenue, the presence of a subway station has been the absolute catalyst to the economic revival of those neighborhoods. Uh, we have much to thank for Metro in that regard. Metro is, is not only essential to the efficient functioning of this region, but it is also essential to the daily operations of the federal government, which gives the federal government a most decided stake in terms of the success of this system. 
The federal government relies on Metro for daily transportation of visitors to the Capitol and national events. You have already, I believe Congresswoman Norton mentioned the great role that Metro played in the recent inauguration. And we're extremely proud of our general manager who has served with distinction here and elsewhere. Metro is a critical component for ensuring continuity of federal government operations during an emergency. 9-11 uh, is another example of how Metro really made the key difference in terms of keeping that sy system, uh, keeping our system open. Let me say a word about dedicated funding. Uh, at this point in time, um, uh, as a member of the Council of the District of Columbia and Chairman of the Committee on Trans uh, Public Works and Transportation, we're going to make certain that this opportunity for dedicated funding is not lost, nor it, will it be hindered. And I will introduce legislation in the Council on an emergency basis on May 5th to have identical legislation to that which was passed in Virginia and Maryland so that we will be ready, Mr. Chairman, to present to this Congress uh, compact amendments which are identical and will pave the way, hopefully, in this year for a federal appropriation. We are extremely pleased with the great step that was taken by the Congress last year in passing an authorization which could lead to $3 billion into the system over a 10-year period. Uh, and we want to make certain that that happens. When I became chairman of the Metro Board uh, this past February, uh, I, 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 I expressed my determination that this funding would go forward insofar as anything we could do to make it happen. Uh, we are anxiously awaiting news as to whether or not the President has included the first payment, which we hope will amount to $150 million, in the President's budget. If the President has not included it in the budget, we want to rely on our many good friends in Congress to make sure that the $150 million is added. And I do want to acknowledge most particularly the efforts of the Majority Leader, Congressman Steny Hoyer, who has played such a key role in this regard. So this uh, 300 million new funds on an annual basis, 150 million from the Congress of the United States, 150 million dollars from each, 50 million dollars each from the three jurisdictions is going to make a critical difference in the stability of Metro because at present what we need to do is to assemble a patchwork quilt every year with our budget, and this will instead give us the ability for a coherent, stable budget uh, proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Mr. Cato, you're recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as stated, I'm John Cato, the General Manager of the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, known as Ramada or Metro. Um, joining me is Michael Taborn, who's the Chief of the Metro Transit Police Department who's available to answer questions on our security initiatives. First, I would like to begin by thanking you as well as the members of this full committee for your efforts on the dedicated funding legislation. The funding authorized by that bill is a key to Metro's ability to continue to meet the mobility needs of the federal government in this region. I have submitted more detailed testimony for the record so let me address a few key points that I would be happy to take questions on. As Chairman Graham said, the federal government relies on Metro every day. It bears repeating that 40 percent of Metro's peak ridership is made up of federal employees. Many others ride our system so they can petition the Congress, visit the National Mall, and our national museums and galleries, and also to witness historic events like the inauguration. You can hear it in our station names, Federal Triangle, Capitol South, Smithsonian, Pentagon, and the list goes on. The federal government's dependence on Metro is something that distinguishes us from other transit agencies. It is not surprising that Metro is often referred to as America's subway. I would like to now turn to some of our current challenges. While we have been in fairly good financial shape for this budget year, 2009, this is um, a very difficult time for Metro, as it is for transit agencies across the country, with many facing layoffs and severe service cuts. 
Recognizing the pressure that local governments and individuals are facing in this economic downturn, we began building our FY 2010 budget without uh, indicating any increases from local government or their contributions or raising fares. This required very difficult actions. In recent months, I have made some very tough decisions, including the elimination of 313 positions. And we have reduced our budget gap from $154 million. We've reduced that by 80 percent down to 29 million. And with the jurisdictions looking at very option, various options, have reduced that even further. After considering many options for closing the remaining gap, our board ultimately decided to increase, as I mentioned, local contributions. And we have submitted bus services adjustment for public considerations. We have just completed a series of six hearings on these service adjustments, and tomorrow the Board of Directors will make decisions on what actions they will take in order to close the budget gap. In my written testimony, I also go into detail about another financial challenge that affects Metro and a number of other transit agencies who entered into sell leaseback transitions, uh, transactions back when the federal government was promoting them as innovative financing techniques. Uh, as a result of changes to federal law uh, and of the uh, worldwide economic crisis, Metro and other agencies are at risk of a technical default on these agreements. Despite having made payments, we potentially face millions of dollars in termination fees. However, all is not grim, and we need to look towards the future. Let me turn now from Metro's current financial challenges to talk a little bit about what I see coming in Metro's future. This system is essential to mobility in the nation's capital and the national capital region is shown on Inauguration Day. Millions came to Washington to see the new president, and Mitchell's job was to provide them with transportation. We did so safely and efficiently. When you look towards the future, the future is what we saw on that day, over one and a half million riders on our system on a daily basis. As we move towards the future, there is a need for increased funding for an expansion of the system on the orange, blue, yellow lines, and in fact, a new portal coming in from Northern Virginia. As we looked at our capital needs, we have identified $11.3 billion between 2011 and 2020, and this number does not include any monies for the expansion that I mentioned. We're now working to prioritize this, and we will have that list um, completed over the next week. Again, you will find more details of my testimony um, I'm in front of you in the written testimony, and I thank you for this opportunity um, to testify in front of this subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Cato. Uh, in the interest of time and, and efficiency, we're going to uh, dispense with any further opening statements here. Uh, but I, I would like to ask, uh, uh, since both of you have been at this for such a long time, uh, Mr. Graham, the the reconciling uh, language on the part of uh, the District of Columbia to match the legislation previously passed by Virginia and, and, and Maryland. Where are we in that, in that process? I know there's been some good signals sent, but, but legislatively, where are we? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. The um, legislature in Virginia and the legislature in Maryland have now passed, and just recently passed, uh, identical legislation to the compact for the compact amendments. On May 5th, I will introduce in the council as emergency legislation uh, the same, the identical legislation, okay. which means that certainly in the month of May we are going to be ready to present to Congress uh, the compact amendments that are required by the Authorization Act. Great. Well, that, 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 that's perfect. Uh, the sooner the better, obviously. Uh, I wouldn't want to give any reason for the President's budget team to see an obstacle there and, uh, and uh, to send the wrong signals that that, that money is not uh, prepared to be used or that there are any obstructions there. So if we, could, uh, if we could get that wrapped up, that would be enormously helpful. I just don't want to leave any, any, uh, any obstacle on the way. Uh, Mr. Cato, 
I, I know that uh, I'm actually part of the Rail Security Caucus here in Congress and uh, spend a lot of time. I, I think uh, the numbers are that in this country we have about five times as many people who travel by rail as do by, by airplane. We've spent a lot of money on security in airports. Uh, I don't think we've spent nearly what we need to uh, in terms of rail security. Um, you're part of a system that, uh, this Northeast Corridor, that handles a huge portion of our rail passengers every day. Uh, and because of all the things you've mentioned today about uh, this being our nation's capital, moving so many federal employees, being the heart of our federal government, being the nation's capital, so we have uh, uh, extremely uh, large celebrations, historic moments here in the Capitol, the inauguration, perfect example. Uh, you know, I think, you know, someone who had their family down uh, for, for those festivities, uh, the Metro uh, really, really delivered very, very well. I wish all the parts of our system worked as well as, as Metro did. But uh, what's being done to coordinate the, the larger, I would say, terrorist-centric uh, uh, dimension of rail security with, with the D.C. Metro? I mean, how, how is that working out? Do we have a good coordination? I know you got the chief behind you. He probably can answer. I don't want to put him on the spot. But uh, how, how is that going? Um, I, our relationship with TSA, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Federal Transit Administration, I would rate it as excellent. Uh, I have had um, meetings with all three agencies to talk about coordination of security, not only here in Washington, but across the United States. They have been helpful. Um, could we um, use more monies in security? Absolutely. But given the resources that we have, we have maximized those resources. Um, we've had great support um, from the TSA, um, as well as um, and the Federal Transit Administration. And so from a coordination standpoint, given the resources that we have, um, it's, a, it's a very good relationship and it's excellent coordination. Okay, let me, let me ask, I just came back from Mumbai. Uh, you know, we've done a lot of coordination with different jurisdictions that have been uh, affected. We had a rail summit uh, with the cooperation of the folks in London. Uh, it seems to me that the greatest value has come from uh, training rail workers to actually handle that situation. And some folks think they have a, a plan, but if, if the employees don't know the plan, we don't have a plan. The people that are on those, the rail crews that are on those trains, that in the event, God forbid, we have a disaster on, on, on the uh, Northeast Corridor or on the Metro, uh, those folks have to know what, what they need to do. And uh, that, that's been deficient in a lot of other jurisdictions. And how, how is that, that piece going uh, with your employees? It's going very well. Our chief of police, um, um, he worked for us, and then he worked for the Federal Transit Administration. We had a national responsibility for developing training programs on safety as well as um, security issues. He brought that experience back to us, and as a result, not only do we have written publications that have been given to each employee, but we also have training for all employees and constant reminders of the importance of being the eyes and the ears of security. And also, we're taking it a step further. Uh, we do do periodic announcements to our customers, as well as um, provide information to this region of asking them to support us in providing um, security for this um, system. Great. I see my time has expired. Uh, at this point, I'd like to yield uh, five minutes to the gentleman from California, Mr. Bill Bray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, I want to apologize for my tardiness. Um, those of us in California don't function with rain very well, so you just understand that um, we were all looking up saying, what is that wet stuff? Uh, let, me, let me first, Mr. Graham, let me congratulate you on uh, your chairmanship. And uh, I come from where you're coming from. I, served as chairman of the San Diego Trolley Board. In fact, I was on the board that built the light rail system when everybody said no one is ever going to have uh, rail transit in Southern California. Um, but there is a whole lot of challenges we get into it. And this, you know, Mr. Cato's works um, came out of BART, right? 
the Los Angeles uh, <coughs> system. Okay, yeah. In fact, I'll tell you, we had some run-ins with, with our insurance companies over the problems you ran there of trying to build two systems simultaneously. Yes. Um, I guess we led a uh, bad example for you. You looked at our success and figured it was easy, but you learned it real quick how tough it was. But, Mr. Graham, my biggest concern coming from local government, I was chairman of a county of three million. I served as chairman of the transit board. And the disconnect between local land use and, la and local policymakers and mass transit. I think that one thing we can say, there are probably only two things that we can point to for the American people that really work well in this community. That is the meter maids and the, and the transit system. I apologize to the delegate, but as a local government guy, it's the frustration of always we don't do enough in local government. Um, one of the studies, Mr. Graham, that we really looked at when I was serving on the Air Resources Board in California was the huge benefit in air pollution and, f and reduction in fuel consumption if the locals will coordinate development patterns to reflect the market demands for transit. I think too often, especially it's one of my frustrations in Southern California, they say, why don't we have more? And I said, well, there's no market there. We haven't developed, you know, we haven't developed in a pattern of market. Um, though D.C. probably as well as any community has tried to respond to opportunities created by the metro, um, how aggressive are we in our local land use patterns in this region of actually not only allowing but mandating intensification develop, development around these transit centers, not just after they're constructed, but a good example is the proposal out to the airport. How much pressure is being put on the local people to rethink, re-engineer, and rezone, even in opposition to local community concerns, um, based on the fact that this transit system needs to have that kind of uh, support. And I say that with the former chairman of Fairfax out there. Um, we need to put that pressure on. And I say that from an environmental point of view, that I just had a community abandon its density around a transit center. And I understand I came from a small city. But is there anybody there doing the pushback to look at the big picture and try to counter that not in my backyard so that we address these things properly, both from the environmental and to make Metro more economically viable? Would the gentleman yield? Yes. Um, just uh, because, because you do, uh, you did invoke my jurisdiction. I'm pleased to uh, assure my colleague, um, in the Dulles uh, quarter, uh, which is 23.1 miles, we completely di redid uh, the rezoning at high end density so that it will be a transit oriented development quarter along all of the planned stations. A very dramatic change in land use pattern. It was not without some controversy, but we did it. Yeah, in fact, I'll just say, Mr. Graham, flat out, um, somebody coming with air, from the air side, I believe that our, the um, Clean Air Act should be amended to require it so that it helps local people to do the right thing rather than, the, because the politics pushes the other way, as you know, and as the chair, former chairman knows. But yeah, I, I, as a local government guy, I like your comments about that whole issue. And I know it's not something we talk about because this is long term, but that does matter. Go ahead. Well, Congressman, uh, you've already referenced the fact that you have one of the leading experts on this issue, on a member of your very panel here, and that is uh, Congressman Connolly, who has spent a lot of time making these things happen, you know, in Northern Virginia. Uh, let me just speak for the District of Columbia. I mean, we have truly embraced the whole concept of restore the core, you know, and, and you know, through the joint development program at uh, Metro WMATA. And you can see virtually all of our stations in the District of Columbia have benefited from, you know, the joint development efforts. And, uh, you know, this is example after example. In fact, I think in some ways, with all due respect to my fellow, uh, my colleagues on the Metro Board, I mean, we, D.C. has led the way. You know, Columbia Heights, U Street, Georgia Avenue, downtown Gallery Place, if you look at our living downtown, so much of this is traceable right back, you know, to Metro's abilities to develop the land near uh, its stations. And so it's, it's been, a, I think it's a really a huge success story. And I occasionally chide our distinguished uh, general manager that I think we should do a, a far more flamboyant job of saying how well we're doing in this regard, because it's made an absolutely critical difference in the District of Columbia. Okay, and, and just to be balanced on this, a lot of this is not the community opposition. A lot of times intensification development is the property owner, the land developer, 
will not be looking 20, 30 years ahead, is looking for what is marketable today and not worrying about the big picture. And I think this issue of siting of transit centers in a community is a responsibility um, that the community has to reflect that part of having the privilege of having these lines come in is that they need to make, accommodate them to where they are economically viable. And you have developers sometimes who do not want to develop out to the density. And I have told them flat out, I would rather have an empty lot that someday will be dense rather than average out and allow you to respond to an existing market today rather than looking to the future. And I thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Thank you. Uh, Chair, now I recognize the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, uh, Ms. Holmes Norton, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I congratulate the district was the first to put up its share initially when we were going for these funds and it helped in, in our, ad, our advocacy. Um, I don't know, Mr. Bilbray, I think that uh, Mr. Cato's, uh, I, I like to ascribe Mr. Cato's success to the fact that he's a native Washingtonian, but I guess I'll let that go. Uh, let me ask you both this. Uh, WMATA has recently uh, listed its uh, use of recovery funds. Um, let, will those be obligated? You know, we're tracking these funds, and our, our there's another committee I'm on, transportation infrastructure, you know, has a use it or lose it uh, rule. Uh, what assurance can you give us that those funds will be obligated within those, 100, those 90 and I guess 120 day time frames? Um, Congresswoman, absolute assurance. In fact, the communications I have given um, to the Federal Transit Administration has been uh, Romata will, will spend their dollars on capital programs that will again help the operation of the system before the timeline indicated in the legislation. Do you have any idea and, how many jobs will be created? Yes, um, over um, 4,800 jobs uh, will be created. Um, I was amazed to note that you apparently have had some trouble getting um, bus drivers, or at least that was what was said when there was a bus driver who was uh, caught in a, some kind of malfeasance and he turned out to have been recently released from prison. We like the fact in this committee that um, ex-offenders can get jobs uh, of that kind. He seemed to have been rather, rather recently <laughs> released. And uh, a spokesman said, uh, spoke of the difficulty in getting uh, um, uh, bus drivers. Here, here are good union high-paying jobs. Could you explain what the difficulty has been? Well, we have not had difficulties in the recent years, uh, recent two years. There have been peaks and valleys if you go back and look over the past 10 years uh, of the availability of, of individuals for that workforce. But recently, when we had a job fair, we had hundreds and hundreds of applications, in fact, over 1,000. The issue becomes when we go through the screening process, that number drops significantly. Out of a thousand applicants, one hundred well, might they, make it through the initial Apparently, you could have a you could have a felony. Uh, you, you could have a felony, and I'm and I'm not arguing against that. It seems to me it has to be job related in order for somebody to be uh, to, to be to be disqualified because he's been in prison. So what is what is is it because people have not? I mean, you train drivers, don't you? Um, yes, we do. We we train. So what, what, So you, the numbers drop. And I say, if this, this man who was recently released from right. prison could become a driver, I'm wondering what it is. Certainly having a record isn't the reason it drops. What is the reason that the numbers drop so precipitously? Um, primarily, it's, you know, it's a skill set. It's the hours that we work once people get into the interview process. Um, often it is um, a felony record. We require that employees not have had a felony or major one in uh, in the last two to four years. This was an anomaly in our process. It was in um, something that occurred. The felony occurred 10 years before. Unfortunately, we didn't take into effect that he was in prison during that 10 years. Um, yeah. so uh, we've corrected our way. processes since then. I can assure you that that would not occur again. But in fairness of the, the employees that we have hired who happen to have had some felony, and we have um, several of those, there have been outstanding operators, outstanding employees. Um, and we, it, would, we, we would certainly encourage, yes. encourage that. Um, that was unfortunate. 
Um, great priority of, of mine and of the Congress, of the administration, is alternative fuels. I don't know if they're hybrid buses. I know they're natural gas buses. Uh, when you buy new equipment, such as buses, are you focusing on greening WMATA? Um, yes, and yes, we are. Every vehicle that we purchase now, every bus will be either a hybrid or compressed natural gas, and that decision was made by our board of directors that uh, several years ago. That is just exceptional news. We, uh, some of us fought up here for WMATA to, to buy natural gas buses during the last go-round. It was quite a bit, quite, quite a fight. I know that, that some difference in cost, but we now have come to understand those differences are are very important. The Amalgamated tra uh, tra uh, uh, Transit Union has written a letter uh, that we have received that we allow the use of, of federal transit funds for operating assistance purposes. I think they were concerned with the layoffs uh, that have been so uh, decried in this region. Uh, would this solve, uh, help solve your dilemma? Can any of those funds be used uh, to help Thwart uh, the, um, uh, the 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 layoffs. Uh, is there any flexibility on this issue that you have or would suggest? There is some flexibility under the uh, preventative maintenance, and for the the upcoming budget, we did transfer additional um, preventative maintenance dollars over, so it relieves your operating side, but. When you take from one side to the other, you, you're creating a larger problem on your capital side, and that's where we have the largest need. But any funding that we receive, of course, um, helps us um, provide the services that we need in this region. But we can't take all of our capital dollars and, make, and turn them into operating expenses. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Chair, now I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Conley, for five minutes. I thank the Chair. Um, and, and, and uh, let me uh, welcome both uh, Chairman Graham and, uh, and Manager John Cato uh, to, uh, to the subcommittee hearing. Uh, and, and Mr. Graham, I, I want to thank you for your willingness to introduce emergency legislation. Quite candidly, I wish you didn't have to, because I actually think the D.C. approach is the correct approach. Because uh, the big sticking point is whether we have permanent federal membership on the Metro Board or not, my view is we should have federal voting representation so long as federal funds are flowing. Um, and, and while I understand the necessity, and I completely agree with the chairman, we don't want any impediment or any excuses for that $150 million matching federal funds. I do believe that we are going to come to regret someday in the future having two federal members who are going to be voting on how localities should be spending their money. Uh, and I, I just think, you know, and then you're going to have to amend the compact at some future date uh, wondering how did this happen. Uh, but unfortunately, we didn't win that battle. But I think you were right in the first place. Um, I recently introduced a bill to authorize extensions of Metro Rail's orange, blue, yellow, and purple lines in Northern Virginia. Um, Mr. Cato, I just wonder if you might comment on, on the, uh, how that might help or, or hurt Metro and, and what your attitude is about future extensions. Well, it's, it's going to be critical as we move forward to the future to have extensions. And um, with those extensions, not only the extension of the line, but looking at another portal coming um, into our main service area. So. Um, your legislation is timely. Uh, we're reaching capacity very quickly on our rail system. And this legislation begins the process of taking that into consideration for future expansion. Um, the federal government process for funding transit is quite different than the federal government funding of roads and bridges. Could you comment on that a little bit? And any ideas based on your experience, uh, especially with the most recently rail to Dulles, uh, but in any expansions of the metro system, uh, any suggestions about how we might streamline the federal process? Absolutely. The suggestion is, is to make the transit um, funding process very similar to the highway process. It is um, more complex. It requires a cost-benefit analysis. Um, the process to go through takes longer, um, as you are very aware of with the Dulles extension. Um, and I've had discussions with the Federal Transit Administration. They are aware of it. It will take um, some action on the part of, I believe, Congress to change um, um, the legislation. And you'll have that opportunity with the reauthorization bill that's coming up this year. 
I look forward to working with uh, Chairman Overstar and trying to do that and, and you as well. Uh, Mr. Graham made reference uh, to uh, uh, the economic benefits and, and I think rightfully so said D.C. And, and I would say the inner suburbs, Arlington and, and inner suburbs of Maryland, clearly show uh, the transformative value of the transit investment. I was here. I lived in Washington, D.C. in 1972 through 1977. Uh, and uh, so I saw pre-Metro Washington and post-Metro Washington, and it has been nothing short of transformative. Um, and, and I think Mr. Bill Bray is right in, in raising that issue of the land use relationship, but also what is the return on investment. Have we, have we got some methodology for uh, calculating what the return on, on the investment of Metro has been to the national capital region? The latest numbers, um, in fact, I had them updated today, um, showed a, an investment of um, $25 billion. But when we updated that number, we found that really the investment has been $40 billion in the District of Columbia only. You mean and the economic investment? The economic benefits of, of the metro system. Wow. And, and it's much larger when you take it from a regional And what was the original federal investment? Um, I, you know, I don't recall, $6 billion. Uh, yes. So a pretty good return on investment. Yeah. Um, final, final question, because I'm, I'm going to run out of time. Um, we don't have a dedicated, we don't yet, but hopefully, as Mr. Lynch said, we will soon have a dedicated source of uh, funding through, uh, through this uh, legislation. How do other transit systems do it in terms of dedicated funding sources? Generally, most transit agencies have a local sales tax, or um, it's specified in their legislative um, state legislation that a portion of the state revenues will go to public transit. Um, we're unique. The only large transit property in the United States that does not have a sales tax funding source. Could I just add, uh, you know, because uh, we're, we're right in the middle of doing our D.C. budget, and I just want to add that the District of Columbia will be sending more than $300 million in our subsidy and, and other, other financial contributions in FY10 to give uh, some idea of the magnitude of the local support uh, that the District of Columbia is providing to this system. And uh, I know my time is up, Mr. Chairman, but I can't help but observing on the tragedy of 9-11, uh, I remember very well there, there was, a, thank goodness, an abortive attempt to close Metro. Um, had we, in fact, closed Metro that day, we would have, I think we'd still be, you know, in uh, gridlock in this region, uh, but thanks to Metro, uh, a situation that could have been uh, much, much worse uh, uh, was not, and, uh, and it just underscored just the importance of the Metro system in getting workers, especially federal workers, to and from their homes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, I know that we have two members that are trying to get here for this panel, uh, and uh, why don't I do this? I know we don't exhaust all of the issues uh, in our questioning. Um, how about, you know, uh, Mr. Graham and Mr. Cato, if you have any issues that we haven't touched upon that you think are, are keenly important to, to the system and to our work, I'd like to give you each, uh, say, five minutes to address the issues that are on your mind most prominently. Uh, and if, if uh, any of that embrace the issues that you might have on. Uh, I read the audit report from 2008. I noticed a pretty good spike in uh, utilization of workers' compensation, a uh, pretty good spike or, or, or a gap in funding on the pension side. If, uh, if you might have information on those couple of issues, uh, we'd, we'd like to hear that. And hopefully, uh, by the time you're finished addressing those, the members might be here. I don't want to keep you longer than you've been very generous with your time, but uh, please. Well, I will gladly take this opportunity, Mr. Chairman. Um, as I was making my presentation, I, I went through a few pages because of, of time running out. Um, but again, as mentioned, the metro system is beginning to fill this age. Um, and an analogy I like to make, it's like a, a house is over 32 years old and, and we need to go beyond a spring cleaning or a paint job. Um, we need some major work done. We have a wet basement, rusty pipes, and um, old wiring and other issues. And so from the standpoint as we look towards the new um, transportation bill, the reauthorization, as we in the industry like to talk about, this authorization is to ensure that sufficient funds are there 
to keep major transit agencies in a state of good repair. Um, the federal government has made a tremendous investment in this system. And um, that investment need to be kept in a state that we can continue to move people as we do today um, and also to expand that. So that's a point as you look forward. From the standpoint of workers' compensation, when I arrived um, here just over two years and four months ago, we had major issues from a safety standpoint um, for our employees and our customers. And we've come a long way. We've had recently, and it's communicated to the board, um, decreases in the number of work-related injuries, um, 10, 20, 30 percent of injuries over the past two and a half years. That still isn't good enough and we're working to reduce that even more so. From the standpoint of our um, issues with our customers, our operators have been performing um, at a much higher rate of safety. Um, we've moved from a situation of the nightmare of five fatalities. Um, um, my first year in 2007, pedestrian fatalities to zero last year. And knocking on wood, um, zero hopefully for the next decades and decades ahead. And I attribute that to our safety program and the attention of our senior operators. Um, we're working very hard again on the workers' comp. We've hired a new risk manager who began two weeks ago. Um, we've got the claims down. Now we're really uh, managing those claims far better than what we had before. And so we're in a transition as an organization that's focusing on safety. And you will see major improvements both financially as well as in the number of injuries. From a pension standpoint, um, like every um, organization around the country and every federal and private agency, we've been hit tremendously by the downturn of the stock market. Um, and as a result, we will um, be looking at, uh, we still will make our contributions. We're committed, we, they're sufficiently funded, but in order to make up that difference, it's going to take a longer period of time. Very good. I understand. Uh, we have uh, one of our members just trying to get in. In the meantime, I'd like to offer Ms. Holmes Norton uh, a chance to uh, expound on an earlier question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I didn't get to ask a couple of questions. Uh, first, let me ask, when was the last fare increase for WMATA? Um, one year ago, January, there was a fare increase um, that was in place. Uh, over, uh, um, my impression is that fair, that w w what you're trying to do today, you of course have to do. You have to, <laughs> notion of fares going up. But my impression is that WMATA has withheld fare increases over long periods of time and then had to raise fares. Uh, and I, I wonder if you've given thoughts to, or in other, if other transit systems is, is, is simply put off the day of reckoning and then have to make a larger fare increase than that, than, than, than would otherwise be necessary just because they stay, hate it and the public hates it ever. So they're going to hate it, but they may hate it more if you have to make up for lost time. Well, if I may respond to that, yes, sir, uh, Mr. Congresswoman. The, um, what we were ending up with when we started talking about a fare increase was a very tiny amount of money in the scheme of things. We were talking about a remaining budget gap of $29 million. And as we were able to demonstrate, uh, the jurisdictions rapidly came up with more than half of that in additional subsidy payments, including the District of Columbia, including Fairfax County, uh, and, and elsewhere. Well, this time, and Mr. Graham, I, I understand. I, I, was, I was, and you've been on the WMATA board before. I was, I was I, I, actually, because I don't see how you could have raised fares <laughs> with a straight face. But I'm wondering whether or not uh, transit authorities have um, any policy on whether or not it's best to wait for a long period of time. You've just raised one, so it would have been terrible to raise another. Uh, uh, let the needs build up because the public hates it so bad, or is that just you have to, you, ha you just have to do that almost politically and decide when you can do it and when you can't? Well, I, you know, I can express my own personal philosophy in this regard. Thank you. Um, I have generally not favored fair increases except when it was absolutely necessary. And, and we did it a year ago, January, as Mr. Cato pointed out. Uh, at that time, we held the bus riders harmless in terms of any increase on the theory that they were the least able 
to pay, but we did manage to have the f to raise the revenues that we needed all the same. And, and I think having just raised the fares, you know, I don't think we want to go back to that well when we don't need to. And the fact of the matter is this $29 million remaining budget gap was rapidly filled within a few days by the jurisdictions. And yeah, I when think people saw that what they faced was... That was, tells the tale. Yeah, with, with ra raising fares, they, they quickly uh, came over. Could I just ask Mr. Cato perhaps to get this back to me? Uh, it, well, Wamata well, may have to take the lead on this. I have been getting money in the transportation bill um, to because because Wamata needs the First Street Tunnel at where Amtrak or Union Station is located because of the need to uh, improve access to BRE, Mark, uh, to the Noma section of DC. Uh, and in order to continue to get those funds, Somebody is going to have to take the lead. It seems to me that it, between Amtrak and WMATA, and WMATA has the most to gain, uh, we all need to meet. Uh, I've had pretty good luck, but there is a reauthorization coming up. So that's when you have the best luck. I wonder if you have any views on that or any plans, given the fact that there's really regional trains, rapid rail and the like coming in. Uh, to Union Station and be doing where they can go so to accommodate more such Absolutely, transit. Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, uh, we are participating, but I've directed my staff to work with the entire region in taking a leadership role in the coordination of, of rail services to ensure that um, we're using similar technology and also to ensure the connectability of the system. So we will be getting back to the committee with the latest update on this very shortly but we are actively involved, and I can assure you we will stay involved and take whatever role that's necessary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the chair now seeks unanimous consent to allow Mr. Van Hollen, the gentleman from Maryland, uh, to proffer questions to the, the witnesses. Hearing no objections, the gentleman from Maryland is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank you for holding this hearing, and I want to thank you for uh, your support uh, for what is often described as the nation's metro system because it does carry uh, so many uh, federal employees uh, to work uh, every day that do the work uh, of our country uh, here in Washington. And I want to thank both the gentlemen for their testimony. Council Member Graham, uh, I commend you for the legislation that you've introduced. Uh, I think when you complete action on that, it will mean Maryland, Virginia, and the District of Columbia have all passed the required uh, legislation uh, to conform with the uh, requirements for the additional federal funds uh, for Metro. So we look forward to continue to work with you uh, on that effort. Uh, Mr. Cato, uh, congratulations on a, a good, strong start. As I know it's been a little while uh, now, but uh, things uh, seem to be going well, although I do have a couple uh, concerns uh, that I wanted to raise. Uh, and this is in the context, first let me ask you about the, the stimulus dollars, the economic recovery plan dollars. If you could just provide some real detail on exactly what additional funds the metro system uh, expects to receive as a result of the economic recovery plan and what exactly that means with respect to uh, WMATA operations. Um, we will receive approximately $202 million as part of the economic <laughs> stimulus package. Um, some for buses, paratransit vehicles, fixing platforms, rail work, heavy equipment for the rail system. Um, to date, we have 40 of those contracts on the street, um, so we're ready uh, to move forward to spend the monies, and we have sent our um, necessary paperwork to the Federal Transit Administration, and that process is moving very smoothly. Now, do you expect to receive that $202 million in this fiscal year over a period of uh, what period of time? Um, we expect to, to commit 80 percent of the dollars by September and the remaining 20 percent um, by the end of the calendar year. Okay. And uh, so by the end of the calendar year, you will expect to all the contracts to have been let. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, I do have a concern. I know you, uh, hopefully, re you've received a letter that uh, Steny Hoyer and I and Donna Edwards uh, sent to you and your team uh, about the, the cuts that have been made in, in Metrobus in the suburban Maryland area in both Prince George's and Montgomery County. I mean, we are very 
concerned about the impact. More people obviously rely on public transit during a period of economic downturn. Uh, our, our hope had been that these stimulus dollars, these additional stimulus dollars, uh, would allow you to continue to operate uh, these kind of lines. And so a lot of people are wondering, you know, where did, where did that, where'd that money go? How come we can't be using some of that money to make sure that people can continue to get to work? Um, well, those monies, some of those monies can be used for preventative maintenance, which would offset some of the costs. Uh, we just had a series of, he of hearings, five of those. Tomorrow, the Board of Directors will consider what it needs to do to close the gap, which is just slightly over $13 million. Um, capital dollars or stimulus dollars can be used um, to close the gap or um, other reserve monies that we have, or we can make the service cuts. Those discussions will occur tomorrow. Um, I might like to mention that Chairman Graham did propose that at one time that we use stimulus dollars. Um, that, again, decision will be discussed tomorrow. Well, I encourage you, and uh, the cha Chairman, thank you for uh, proposing that we use stimulus dollars to keep some of these uh, lines and services uh, operational because, again, m as we said, I mean, more and more people are turning uh, to Metro which, in, in these economic times. And we, of course, want to encourage people, whether times are tough or times are good, uh, to use our uh, public transit system. So I hope we wouldn't be uh, cutting uh, those uh, services. Uh, if I could just ask one other question, uh, Mr. Chairman, with respect to uh, where Metro stands now on the, on the issue that arose uh, last year uh, with respect to the, the leaseback payments that were then essentially guaranteed through AIG and the credit default swaps and uh, there was the threat and litigation. And I think we all worked together to try and mitigate the impact. If you could just give us an update on where things stand. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we had 16 uh, leaseback transitions, um, three which we resolved and closed. One through the court process, we came to a settlement. We have 12 remaining. Um, again, they are no longer any AAA uh, rated insurers which technically put us in default um, and um, which would expose millions of taxpayers' dollars. Uh, they're still at risk in spite of the fact we're making all the payments. And so we're hoping that there will be some legislative solution or an administrative solution from the um, Treasury Department. Thus far, no other um, banks have um, notified us that they are going to declare us in default, but technically they could do that um, at any day. All right. Well, we look forward to continuing to monitor that okay. situation. And again, uh, thanks for hope tomorrow we will uh, not make those uh, service cuts. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Just real briefly, uh, uh, Mr. Cato just mentioned that there are no AAA insurers left, and that is a problem for all municipalities yes. issuing bonds in the United States. Uh, I have some legislation that is uh, before the, uh, the Finance, House Finance Committee. We are going to have a hearings in May uh, on that legislation that would address that situation. Thank you, sir. Well, we want to thank the uh, witnesses for being so free and candid and uh, generous with your time. Uh, we are sure that there will be, uh, be other hearings where we'll have to call, call you again for your, your, uh, your opinions and, and recommendations. But, uh, Thank you for attending this hearing, and we bid you good day. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to.